This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. Well, we left it last time, having looked at those non-pool assets. And by far the most likely non-pool asset that you're ever going to see is a car. A car, of course, that has private use by whom? By the proprietor. We never get concerned about private use by an employee, something we're going to witness in a moment when we look uh, together at this example based on the things that we were looking at last time. And of course, based on the things that we've done up until now as well, it's all consuming. It's a pretty typical example of a capital ounces computation that you may be called upon to prepare. But those non-pool assets usually can't, doesn't have to be, could be anything with private use by the proprietor, but 99 times out of 100, that's what it's gonna be, a car. So far as a car is concerned, of course, when we acquire such a car, with private use by the proprietor, we separate it out from the pool. We create its own column, indicating at the top of that column the extent of the business use, because that's the part of the capital allowance that we'll be able to claim from what was available, be it 18% or 8%, depending on the CO2 emissions of the car, the amount that we're able to claim there is going to be restricted to the business use proportion. Okay. In this example, we've got indeed just that, cars with private use, indeed cars with private use by the proprietor. And we've got to deal with the normal uh, main pool items as well. So let's see how we'll tackle this problem. Again, we want the capital allowances computation, and this for this particular accounting period, the year ended, the 31st of December 2018. So again, as usual with such questions, if it's an ongoing business, we're given at the beginning of the question, your opening balances, the tax written down, values brought forward upon any pool, be it main, be it special rate. And of course, as we'll witness here, any non-pool asset as well. So we've got the main pool at 21.2. So we'll need a column for that. We've got this car, which has got 30% private use by Jane therefore just 70% business use, and we have its tax written down value, we'll have a column for that. We know we're always going to need an allowances available column to record the claims that we make for this period. And of course, we check out to see whether there's any expenditure that will have ranked for either AIA or FYA. And we keep a little working column on the left-hand side of our uh, columns there to record such expenditure. So what have we got? The following transactions took place during this accounting period. So, 10th of May 18, purchase plant for £6,600. Plant, that of course is your normal AIA qualifying expenditure, which not that it'll be an issue, but that type of expenditure, that if in excess of 200000 which clearly it isn't, would be a main pool item. Of course, at this stage, we don't know how much other expenditure we're going to see and whether that might be main pool or special rate pool. So we note that down. June 18, purchased a motor car for £10,600. CO2 emissions, 100 grams per kilometre, indicating, therefore, what level of allowance will be available to be used by an employee. Now they tell you what is the percentage business stroke private use. It doesn't matter. If it's private use by an employee, this does not impact in terms of the capital ounce computation of the business. Where that will be an issue is, as we'll see when we come, as we said earlier, to chapter nine, it's going to be an issue when dealing with the employee's employment income assessment that there would be an assessable benefit to derive in relation to the provision by the employer of a company car company in inverted commas there, but the car supplied by the business. But it doesn't impact at all in terms of our capital allowance computation. So in which case it's not a non-pool asset. It's going to be, well, look at those grams per kilometre. What category does that fit into? Therefore, it's in excess of uh, 50 grams. So we're talking about a WDA being available in relation to it. No first year allowance. We know we never have AIA in relation to cars. So then the question is, what level of WDA? Now, because this is between 51 and 110 grams per kilometre, that, of course, means that we're talking about 
a main pool item and therefore an 18% writing down allowance. 15th of October 18, again of course within this uh, accounting period, sold the motor car used privately by Jane for £9,400. So we sell that car. Now then, if it's a non-pool asset, which it is, being sold, then what have we got to compute? A balancing adjustment. That balancing adjustment will compare the sales proceeds up to a maximum of original cost. They don't tell you the original cost, but they don't have to. Because look, that tax written down value, 13,600, clearly a figure lower than the cost. Well, the sales proceeds there at 94 are lower than the tax written down value. So of course the proceeds are lower than original cost. So that is the figure that we will use. And of course, we will have to, you'll have to answer this question in a moment's time, if we are now selling for 94 with a tax written down value of 13.6, what type of balancing adjustment will that give rise to when you sell at below the tax written down value? Hopefully you know the answer to that. Now, of course, uh, Jane was not uh, without a car for very long because the next day on the 16th of October, purchased a car for £16,000, CO2 emissions 180 grams per kilometre, clearly well in excess of 110, so we're talking here about an 8% writing down allowance. Will that go to the special rate pool? No, it won't, because it too is used 30% for private purposes by Jane, the owner of the business, the proprietor. So it will have its own separate column. So in terms of the computation you now need to set up, we do have AIA, so we need our little working our AIA stroke FYA column. We have, as we see, got a main pool upon which WDA will be available. We need that, of course, as a separate column. We inherited this original car at the start of the accounting period. It has been sold and replaced with another one, so we're going to need separate columns for each of those two separate vehicles there. The one that was owned at the beginning of the period and sold off during the period is, as we've just been saying, going to give rise to a balancing adjustment that will close down that particular column, that computation. And, of course, on the 16th of October 2018, then we buy the new one and that creates its own separate uh, computation, its own separate column on that CA comp there. Remember, in terms of when you buy within the period, that does not dictate the level of writing down allowance that is available. The only time of writing down allowance is other than a straight 18% or 8% the straight main pool or special rate pool figure. The only time where we're going to time apportion that is when the length of the accounting period itself is other than 12 months. Then you'll either net down or gross up. Is it less than 12 months? Is it more than 12 months as an accounting period? When within the accounting period you happen to buy a car that will rank for writing down allowance, that does not impact at all. It is a full available WDA based on the length of the period, not the date within the period that you happen to buy the asset upon. OK, so we need to set up, of course, those columns on our computation, get your tax written down values and then deal with the transactions in the normal way. Do we have any AIA qualifying expenditure? Yes, we do. We purchase the plant. We will deal with it, and clearly 100% AIA will be available on the very small amount of 6,600. We then see that we have bought a car that will go to the main pool. So that's an other addition. Those other additions, basically cars, that will rank for WDA, but not AIA and not FYA. Having got the addition sorted that rank for AIA, that rank for WDA, then we deal with disposals. There is just that one disposal, and it is of the non-pool asset, giving rise, therefore, to a balancing adjustment. On the main pool, you will simply, of course, be claiming a writing down allowance. But 
we haven't yet dealt with all those transactions, we, play, we, we replace the old non-pool asset with a new non-pool asset, so we set up a column for it as well. So let's have a look, therefore, at, uh, again, if at this point you feel confident enough to tackle this yourself, please do and uh, tune out now and have a go at that. But otherwise, I'll take you through to the answer and show you, well, the demonstration of what we've just been discussing. So here we go. We've got our AIA stroke FYA column. We've got main pool. We've got the original non-pool card that we inherited at the start of the period. And we've got our tax written down values brought forward for each of those two figures. We then, of course, got the new business, 70% uh, business use car. So that's its own separate column. And then finally, as ever, the allowance is available. Right. What do we deal with first after picking up the opening tax written down values? It is, of course, those additions that qualify for AIA. That was just the plant. No problem with the AIA. All of that is available in full, and that transfers into the allowances available column, and there's nothing to go into your main pool. The other additions, i.e. cars here, that will rank in relation to the availability of a writing down allowance this period. Now, there's two separate issues. Based, of course, on CO2 emissions, that will dictate whether we get an 18% or an 8% writing down allowance. But what we also now need to segregate out is cars that are bought for employees use compared to any car that is bought for an owner, a proprietor's private use there. So the first car costing £10,600, that was bought for the use by an employee. So that's a main pool item. It's main pool because it's 100 grams per kilometre. The 180 grams per kilometre if it too was to be used by an employee, then we'd have needed to have set up a special rate pool because very clearly 180 grams per kilometre is a lot more than 110 grams per kilometre and therefore it would be the reduced WDA, pardon me, the reduced WDA and that would be a special rate pool item. But it isn't a pool, it's a non-pool asset because it's only 70% business use. So into the new column set up for it, the addition goes. The disposal, of course, is of the old uh, private use vehicle. Take the proceeds, because clearly they are less than cost, away from your tax written down value, and we get a figure of 4,200. So we've got a positive 4,200. What does that mean? It means that if we sell for less than tax written down value, then we haven't claimed as yet all of the available capital allowances due to us on the ownership of that asset. Remember, they had to compensate us for the net cost of ownership, the difference between what we originally paid for it and now what we sell it for. Well, we haven't had enough allowances. What is that difference? Well, as we can see, £4,200 because we are due more allowance, a balancing allowance therefore arises. Now that's the 4,200 which closes off that particular call. It's not going any further, it's history. But we can't transfer the 4,200 pounds over here. No, we can't do that. Why? Because we're only entitled to 70% of any allowances. Therefore, take 70% and the actual balancing allowance to be now added in to this capital allowances computation is reduced down to £2,940. We get our claimable part of that balancing allowance, the business use proportion. That again is why I'd always tend to put up here, as we have done, the business use proportion rather than private use, because that's the percentage that you're going to use here either on a balancing adjustment or, if you still owned it at the end of the period, the uh, uh, writing down allowance that would be available to you. We have, of course, got uh, other things to do here. We've got to compute the writing down allowance on the main pool. That's just a straight 18% on the balance at this point in time. That would appear to be, check the numbers please, 5274 and that transfers across into your allowances available column, and of course is deducted 
in deriving the tax written down value on the main pool to carry forward to the next accounting period. One further thing to do, we bought that new non-pool asset, that uh, new car there for Jane's private use. Because of its CO2 emissions, it's only an 8% writing down allowance. Hopefully, that comes out at uh, £1,280. But again, we don't get to claim all of that. We only get to claim the business proportion, the business use proportion. That's 70%. That figure again then goes in and is added into the capital allowances and we get our tax written down value to carry forward to next accounting period. Add up the allowances available column and it would appear that we get 16,160. We know what we do with that. If needs be, deduct it from the adjusted trading profit to give you that tax adjusted trading profit. That therefore is the figure then which we'll see in the next chapter, chapter six, is what you would use in determining what assessment of profit there will be for the relevant tax year of assessment. Remember, back in chapter two, we prepare income tax computations for tax years. So even after in chapter four, calculating the adjusted profit, doing your add backs and your deductions. Now in chapter five, computing and deducting capital allowances. So you have a tax adjusted trading profit. It could be as here for any accounting period. This one happens to be the year ended December 18. We have to have a way of relating that period of profit and the tax adjusted trading profit that we've computed for it. We have to have a way of relating that to the particular tax year in which that profit will be assessed. That's what chapter six is all about. Okay. Uh, I'd like you therefore to go back through this exercise, make sure you're happy with it before again tuning back in. And we'll then look at the other category of non-pool asset that exists. Probably what you won't see it in the context of where we are now, dealing with an unincorporated trader. And probably if it's going to happen at all, you're going to see it in a corporate tax capital allowances computation. But we'll explain all of that when you rejoin us. OK, well, hopefully you were all right with that example and no problems with it. Now, then, having uh, just dealt with the non pool asset being the uh, uh, the use of uh, uh, assets for a private nature by the uh, proprietor, those private use assets there, which as a topic area is incredibly likely for involvement within a, the, our examination. Uh, it can be involved, of course, either in a written question, section C, or it can be involved, of course, as a separate standalone objective testing question. And now having looked at that area, which is really important because it comes up, or uh, well, certainly did on a regular basis, and we would presume from the limited access we have to current papers that it still does. We now go to an area that is incredibly unlikely to feature within an income tax capital allowance computation, but may possibly be seen within a corporate capital allowance computation. Now, again, it's in the syllabus. We need to know how to deal with it. But given that there's a, well, a fair degree of uh, narrative here to discuss this, I don't want you getting worried about it or confused by it. If it gives you a problem, then leave this till later. What you must, must uh, master right from the very beginning now is, of course, dealing with those uh, assets with private use by the proprietor. That's the important one. This one, though, let's deal with it just in case. Right. With the uh, assets with private use by the proprietor, we, the taxpayer, were left with no choice as to how to deal with that particular item. We had to keep it separate. It was by rule by law a non-pool asset and the treatment was enforced upon us. What we're now going to see is a treatment that we the taxpayer choose to bring our, upon ourselves. It's an election. Now if we the taxpayer beat an individual, which I've said is probably unlikely for reasons as I'll explain as I go through, maybe far more likely for a company and a large company at that. So having when dealing with a situation here where it's a claim, it's an election that has to be made by the taxpayer. We are only going to make an election 
if it improves the tax position. If it doesn't improve the tax position for the individual, we're not going to do it. It has to benefit the taxpayer, otherwise it is not worthwhile. Now, we'll see rather more elections when we go through with to other parts of income tax and indeed uh, a lot are on CGT as well, where you have to be able to understand those reliefs, those elections, those claims available to taxpayers. Don't just treat them as a technical issue. Oh, I learned those rules and this is how I do it. You've got to think about, so in what circumstances would that relief be worthwhile? So two aspects to your study of these reliefs, elections, claims, call them as you will there, is in what circumstance would they be worthwhile? And what's the technical side of this? How do I actually deal with it? So where would it be worthwhile? What are the circumstances in which I'd claim? And how do I deal with it? What's the technical side? Right, here in terms of short life assets. As we've said, it's an election. It can be made to emit. Now we'll explain what we mean by short life in a moment's time. Short life assets from the main pool. Therefore, the only assets that could possibly have this depooling election, as we're about to call it here, this depooling election, the only assets that could ever be involved here are assets that would otherwise have gone to the main pool. Not special rate, the main pool. And we include them in their own individual column. It's known as a depooling election. And as we've said, it is any plant and machinery would normally go to the main pool, ah, except cars. Of all the assets we ever have within the business upon which capital allowances are being claimed, probably cars are the ones that you'd most think of as having a relatively short life. Certainly when we explain that that short life, as we'll see in this note here, short life plant and machinery is defined as we're sold at a low residual value or scrapped within eight years following the end of the accounting period in which it was acquired. So it actually is not that short in terms of something in excess of eight years there of ownership prior to disposal. That's what we define, however, as being a short life asset. The ones that we can't have, though, cars. The typical sort of assets that you do see are things like computers and computer equipment, which are very likely to have a life of less than eight years in terms of how technology changes and keeping up to date with that, probably you're going to be disposing of computer equipment and replacing it with new within that period of eight years. OK, so any plant machinery, other than any item of plant that would otherwise have gone to the main pool, except cars, can be treated as a short life asset. And the choice, as we keep saying, is ours. We make that decision whether to make this depooling election in order to keep it separate. Because the idea is that if you create now its own separate column, and this won't be a short life asset pool, it will be each individual asset, each short life asset in its own pool. These are non-pool assets that we're talking in terms of here. That when it is sold off, as you saw with the assets with private use by the proprietor, it brings that column, that computation to an end. And hence, a balancing adjustment will arise. Well, think, what type of balancing adjustment would you want? There are two types. We've got the balancing allowance, we've got the balancing charge. Which of those two would you want? Which would you not want? Well, very obviously, the one that you would want is the balancing allowance. That's an extra capital allowance of that period. The one you don't want is a balancing charge because that reduces, indeed, the capital allowances of the period and may even turn it from a positive figure to a negative, i.e. it could then increase your trading profits rather than decrease if that balancing charge was in excess of the other allowances available for the period. A rare circumstance, but it may indeed happen. OK, now then, the idea of making this election, we said short life plant and machinery where these items are sold at a low residual value or scrapped. Now, that's not within the legislation. That's me telling you 
the circumstances in which this election would be worthwhile. Because we are anticipating two things, not just that it has a short life in the context of that eight year period stated there, but also when it is sold within that short life, that it's going to be sold for sale proceeds that are less than its tax written down value. Because in that way, that will give rise to a balancing allowance. It means that from point when we bought to now point of sale, we will have mopped up all the available allowances due on that asset when it is sold. That doesn't happen with other assets that go into the main pool. What's the basis of your writing down allowance? It is reducing balance and it's only 18%. So on a reducing balance basis, the allowances that you're claiming year on year on any amount of expenditure is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So that expenditure could be around for a very long time until such time as your pool value uh, drops below a thousand pounds as we saw previously and you can make your small pools WDA claim to have all of the remaining figure of something less than a thousand pounds there. So this is a way by which on individual assets with a short life and a low residual value that would otherwise have been included in the main pool and therefore only have had writing down allowance at 18% per annum on a reducing balance basis available. This election ensures that the point we sell, we will get a balancing adjustment. We're only going to do it if it gives rise to a balancing allowance there. Things like computer equipment. If you've got four, five, six, seven year old computer equipment, do you think we're going to be able to sell that for much money or indeed at all? It'll probably just be thrown away as scrap there. So those are the sort of assets that we'd be looking at as being potentially likely. So capital allowances on each short life asset are calculated separately. The only exception to that is if it was your particular business's policy that all of the laptop uh, laptop computers supplied to your employees are replaced every four years, every five years. And there's a hundred of them. They don't then make you do a hundred individual capital allowance computations on each such laptop computer. You can put them into a pool, as it were, and treat it as one because they'll all be disposed of at the same time. They're all scrapped at that one point in time. Otherwise, and as far as you're concerned, an exam question, you're going to have a short life asset. And if there were more than one, then you'd have more than one column. Chances are you won't have more than one to deal with. So on disposal within eight years of the end of the accounting period in which the acquisition took place, a balancing allowance or charge arises. Remember our election. We're only going to make this election if the probability at the time we need to make the election is that we will be looking at a balancing allowance otherwise arising. But also it is an asset that whose cost would otherwise have gone into the pool, the main pool. I'll come back to that later. So balancing allowance or charge arises, which would not occur if the item was pulled. When you sell off individual assets, you take out sales proceeds and you continue on any residual value left within the pool to then claim your writing down allowance. Clearly, the election would only be worthwhile if a balancing allowance was anticipated. If no disposal takes place within that eight years of the end of the accounting period in which the acquisition took place, the unrelieved balance is transferred to the pool. So you thought you were going to keep it for less than the cutoff uh, period there in it, just over eight years. You make the depooling election but you then change your mind and you don't sell it. Then at that point, you transfer it back to the pool. There would be no longer a balancing adjustment on its sale. It goes back into the main pool. When does the transfer take place? Immediately after the eighth anniversary of the end of the accounting period in which it was acquired. Incredibly unlikely that you'd have to do that in terms of any exam question. The AIA, of course, is available against expenditure on short life assets. These are assets that would otherwise have gone into the main pool. 
So it's normal plant and machinery. AIA would be available. So only if expenditures outside this limit, then expenditure on main pool items will qualify for the writing down allowance of 18%. Now, what that means is, if you're qualifying plant and machinery cost for each accounting period for the unincorporated trader is within the £200,000 AIA limit, then you're going to get 100% AIA. There is no balance to go into the main pool. There is no tax written down value on that main pool. You buy £20,000 of plant and machinery, you get 20000 AIA. Next year, you buy 30000 30000 AIA. There's nothing to go into the main pool. So in those circumstances, you are not going to make a depooling election. All that would do when that asset is sold with no tax written down value because you have claimed 100% AIA. All that would do with any sales proceeds is give rise to a balancing charge, which is what you don't want. So you wouldn't do it. So the only time where this election is going to be made or considered at least to be made is if the total expenditure in relation to your main pool in an accounting period has gone above 200,000 and one or other of the assets within that figure of total expenditure above 200,000, one of them is a short life asset, then it makes sense. So what would we do? The AIA, of course, that is available could be matched with short life assets. And if our expenditure is less than 200,000, it will be matched with those short life assets and every other asset will get our allowance as soon as we possibly can. However, if total expenditure on the plant and machinery is above 200,000, then the AIA would be allocated to the main pool additions first, as no balancing allowance occurs on sale. If the AIA is allocated to main pool items first, then a short life asset election could be made on any short life assets with balancing allowances crystallising on disposal. So if we've got £300,000 of expenditure and in there there's £50,000 on a short life asset, then the 200000 AIA would go against the other £250,000 of expenditure that would go to your main pool and have your normal uh, claims thereon. So what we do is we allocate the 200 to the 250, the other 50,000 out of the 250 goes as ever to the main pool and the 50,000 pounds spent on the short life asset set up like we did with the non-pool assets in our previous exercises, set up their own separate column, put the 50,000 in. It won't make any difference to the allowances that you get while you continue to own that asset. It's an 18% WDA. Whether that's as a part of the main pool balance or separated out, it's 18%. So while you continue to own, it's pointless as an election because it's done nothing. The whole point about making the election is for when you sell. Because when you sell, rather than any remaining tax written down value, staying on within a pool and you scratching away at that residual value within the pool on an 18% reducing balance basis year after year after year. Instead of that happening on the short life asset, we're able to claim a balancing allowance and mop up, get all of the remaining capital allowances at the point of sale. Only then is it going to be worthwhile. Now let's see. There aren't going to be too many circumstances in which your unincorporated trader is likely to be having such expenditure in excess of £200,000 a year. So it's probably way more likely that if you're going to see this situation, it will, of course, be a situation dealing with a company, probably quite a large company, where expenditure may run into several hundred thousand pounds a year on plant and machinery. Then allocate the A. IA to the other non-short life assets, make the depooling election for your short life asset so that when eventually it is sold, then you get your balancing allowance. And that's what we're saying here. Given the amount of AIA available at 200,000 a year, 
very unlikely the election would now be worthwhile for most unincorporated traders. We're not going to be spending in excess of 200,000. Now, of course, an exam question may be still set for an unincorporated trader selling a short life asset where the election had been made when AIA was previously at a much lower level. You only know of £200,000, but there were times when it was much, much lower than that, when making, therefore, the depooling election on a short life asset is something that would have happened way more regularly than ever it would now. Because again, we had a much lower level of AIA limit. So you could inherit that situation. Of course, the examiner doesn't have to justify the numbers. There's many got to present you with the numbers and you've got to deal with it. So what we might see is we inherit at the start of our accounting period a tax written down value and what you're told is a short life asset. What then happens this accounting period? It's sold. What therefore do you do? you calculate a balancing adjustment. Hopefully, if we've done our job properly, as it were, as the client there, we're getting a balancing allowance. But there will be a balancing adjustment that then arises, comparing the proceeds with the tax written down value of that asset at the start of the period. Example three below, however, shows both the election being made and the resultant effect on the disposal of the asset. So let's therefore have a little look at example three. Because we're going to deal with the purchase of it and then the later sale of it, we have got two years ended, 31st of March, 1st 2019, and then 2020 to deal with. John prepares accounts to 31st of March. Well, we knew that because those are the two periods for which we now prepare the CA computation. Year ended 31st of March, 19, that began at the 1st of April 18. And we've got our tax written down value on the main pool there at £16,000 to start us off in our capital ounce computation. On the 1st of July 18, John purchased machinery for £220,000. Machinery, normal, basic, standard machinery. That therefore is available, eligible for AIA and his main pool expenditure. But you can see already it's 220,000. It's bigger than 200,000. So only 200,000 pounds would attract AIA and the balance of 20,000 would then drop into your main pool. But also in this period, to be precise on the 1st of September 18 there, John purchased a photocopier for 4,000 pounds and made a short life asset election. So again, that's in the year ended 31st of March 19. If you've got more than one period to deal with and you've got a list of transactions, additions and of course disposals, then what you can do is just look down that list and divide between the two accounting periods. April 18, July 18, September 18, all in that one, the year ended March 19. But the next one is July 19. That's in the year ended March 2020. And therefore, we effectively draw a line at that point. Those transactions to the first computation, that transaction to that computation. And of course, surprise, surprise, the photocopier, the short life asset has lived up to its name. It is indeed a short life and it's sold for £1,500. Right. Set up the capital ounce computation to begin with for the year ended 31st of March 19. What do we have? We have got a tax written down value brought forward on a main pool. Then this period we're buying normal machinery. Therefore, we'll need our AIA column to list out the expenditure and to show our AIA claim. We've also got the photocopier. Now that too would be eligible eligible for AIA. But as the expenditure is already in excess of £200,000, we will allow the £200,000 limit to apply to this main pool expenditure, the 220. And this £4,000 will be broken out as our short life asset. And on that, we'll get our writing down allowance. 
Let's have a look, therefore, at uh, what our answer now should look like. We've got our AIA column. We've got the main pool. We've got the opening tax written down value brought forward. During this first period, the year ended March 19, we buy the short life asset. And of course, as ever, we want the allowances for each period. Additions as ever qualifying for AIA. We've got our machinery, £200,000. We've got our short life asset, the photocopier, 4000 Total, 224. We can only have 200000 which transfers across to the allowances available column. That therefore will leave 24000 But that 24 is split between the 20000 residual amount of the machinery cost that goes there to the main pool, and then the separate photocopier cost that goes to its own column, its own short life asset column. What do we then do? We calculate our writing down allowances. This is a main pool, therefore 18%. Get the figure, transfer across to the allowances column. Our short life asset was otherwise a main pool item, therefore it too has 18%. 720 pounds, hopefully the figure computed. Again, transfer across into the allowances available column. Now at that point, whether you've just gone 18% of 24,000 pounds or done the two separate calculations as we have and we must here, you'd be getting the same overall amount of allowances there. That would be your Combined total 6, 4, 80 and 720, that's as if you'd had 18% of £24,000. But we'll see why we separated out the photocopier with the depooling election in a moment's time. Because now we come to the accounting year to 31st of March 20, bring forward our tax written down values from the end of the previous period, now at the start of this period. All that happens is there's a disposal. And it is the disposal of the photocopier for £1,500. Therefore, on that, there will be a balancing allowance. We are selling, as you can clearly see, for much less than its tax written down value. Therefore, that residue of unbelieved expenditure is a balancing allowance, thus increasing the capital allowances of the period. So far as the main pool is concerned, it's your standard writing down allowance of 18% that goes in. So in relation to short life assets, you probably won't see them in the context of an unincorporated trader, but an examiner can do whatever he wants with the numbers there, where if you're gonna see it, it would probably be more likely in a corporate tax context because companies may very well be spending on a regular basis in excess of 200,000 pounds on qualifying plant and machinery, so not all of the expenditure will therefore rank for AIA. Where that happens, then we pull out of the AIA qualifying expenditure, the short life asset or assets, and put them into their own individual columns, such that when sold, as seen here, you will then benefit from the final balancing allowance being available. Okay, well, Again, have a rework through that. Make sure that you are happy with it. And uh, join us again in our next session where continuing on for the idea of balancing adjustments that we've seen on non-pool assets when they are sold, could we have balancing adjustments on the main or special rate pools? We'll answer that question next time.